And welcome to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Corey Alexander Willett, and it is my joy to be the pastor here at St. B. We have a few announcements this morning. First is that Anne's Closet, our food pantry, is in need. Cheese. Those who 
work diligently to keep Anne's closet going would be deeply appreciative. Next Monday night, July 4th, we will gather in the parking lot at Cookout and Fireworks. You are invited to bring your favorite dessert, chips, and drinks to add to the meal. And you are also invited to bring your favorite fireworks. My family had a rule when we were buying fireworks when I was a kid, nothing little. So do with that as you see fit. On August 6th, in just about six weeks, we will be having our back to school dash. We are already taking donations of money and also of new unused school supplies. The money will go for school backpacks and other items for our neighborhood children and youth before they get started back to school this fall. UMW will not be meeting next month in the month of July, but regular meetings will resume in August. Also, this is not in your bulletin, but newsletters are in the back for pickup. They will be going out via email after the service. And finally, please fill out the attendance pad at the end of your pew so that we know you are worshiping with us today. And now, most importantly, I want you to know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending St. B for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Welcome to worship today. Bring your joys and burdens to the Lord. Remember the wondrous deeds that God continues to perform in your life. Let us be thankful for all the mercies and tenderness that God has to us. Come, praise the Lord with all your heart and soul. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 206, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Lord.
out to us this day, stirring our souls and spirits with the winds of your power that we may faithfully be your disciples. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing together in, our, in the fifth we sing number 2130, the summons.
Bora até aí. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. These are the words of God for the people of God. I see God. You may be seated. Last week, we entered into the longest liturgical season of the Christian year. We are officially in the ordinary time. And during this season, we will journey with Christ to Jerusalem. This morning, we see Jesus as he sets his face, or as other translations translate it, resolutely sets out. To Jerusalem, knowing what awaits him when he gets there. This journey narrative is an important feature in Luke's gospel. And on this journey, we find many familiar and beloved stories, such as the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. We find these stories and other teachings and parables in Matthew and Mark's gospels. But they're in different places than we find them in Luke. Luke intentionally arranges these teachings and parables to remind us that they are connected to Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and urges us to connect these stories to the larger literary context. This journey is not a solitary journey for Jesus. He's accompanied by his disciples, and there are others who wish to join him on the journey. And Jesus' words to those who wish to join them feel harsh. No time to arrange a funeral, even for a parent. No time to say goodbye to family and friends. No one who looks back is fit to enter the kingdom of God. While there's some question about if these are the literal words Jesus said, their point still stands. There are always reasons to postpone the work of discipleship. There are always justifiable reasons to delay the journey. These words to the would-be disciples feel particularly harsh as they have followed Jesus' dismissal of James and John who wanted to bring fire down upon the Samaritans who just rejected Jesus. However, the rebuking of James and John and the words to the would-be disciples serve the same purpose. They demonstrate the importance of maintaining focus on the mission that Christ invites us on. 
Jesus does not respond with violence during this inevitable rejection by the Samaritans. And it's also not a surprising rejection, given the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. This text leaves us with some big questions to ask ourselves. What do we place above discipleship? What does it really mean to follow Christ wherever he will go? To what am I, am I attached today that keeps me from following Jesus fully and freely? For James and John, the temptation of power and violence were placed above discipleship. Far too often it feels as if that the temptation of power and violence can overshadow our own discipleship. When someone disagrees with our beliefs, when someone rejects our understanding of who Christ is, we want to respond with power and control which so frequently turns to violence. When calls for justice and equality feel like threats to our safety, then we are tempted to do whatever it takes to maintain our privilege and power, even if that means resorting to violence. But Christ makes it clear in his rebuke of James and John. Retaliation against the Samaritans. Retaliation against people of a different faith tradition is not an option for disciples. The use of violence to enforce Christian faith is counter to the spirit of Christ. Unfortunately, we have seen violence in the name of Christ throughout Christian history. Christ's name has been used to justify genocide and slavery and war. This violence we have seen is also not just physical violence. It is violent when we use Christ's name to maintain the status quo. It is violent when it refuses to see the full humanity of someone who disagrees with us. It is violent when, we refuse, when it refuses to see the full humanity of someone with different religious beliefs than we hold. But the use of violence to enforce Christian faith is counter to the spirit of Christ. Because this rejection of violence emphasizes God's all-encompassing love. This violence is incompatible with Christ's very identity and mission. Violence and hate are incompatible with Christian teaching. As disciples of Christ, we must be willing to embrace and to be embraced by the radical love of God made known in Christ which is a love that is contrary to our own human understanding of love. Whenever anything stands in the way of Christ's radical love, we have done a disservice to the gospel and to our calling as disciples of Christ. This love forces us to ask ourselves what it really and truly means to follow Christ wherever he will go. It forces us to let go of the things that are keeping us from following Christ fully and freely. To take our cross and follow Christ means rejection. And our response to that rejection is not punishment or a demanding acceptance of Christ and his teachings. It is to extend grace and continue following Christ by emulating his radical, all-encompassing love. To commit to full discipleship is not 
a part-time or momentary commitment. It means choosing Christ and Christ's love over all else. It means going to the cross with Christ, a journey that is not easy. It means recognizing that our faith is not only personal and private. It is one that requires us to live boldly and courageously and counterculturally. It is, to, it is about inviting people on this journey with us, without punishment or shame or violence. In 1739, John Wesley wrote in the preface of Hymns and Sacred Poems, quote, Solitary religion is not to be found here. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows no, of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. The general rule of discipleship is a practical guide for Christians to love God and neighbor together. It makes social holiness possible in that it helps Christians to center their lives together in Jesus Christ. This rule points Christians and the congregation toward the risen Christ. It leads them to join in what he is up to in the world. <clears throat> Holiness is social because God is social. God created human beings in God's own image to be relational creatures. We become fully human when we share in the relationships God initiates with us through the people God places in our way. Social holiness is the practice of obeying Jesus' commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself, and loving one another as Christ loves. When Wesley says that holiness is social, he means that the depth of your love for God is revealed by the way you love those who God loves. Our discipleship is rooted in love. It is rooted in countercultural nonviolence. It is rooted in seeing the humanity in one another. It is rooted in setting aside the things that inhibit our ability to follow Christ fully. So today, I invite you to take some intentional time to answer the question. To what am I attached today that keeps me from following Jesus fully and freely? This invitation is one that requires vulnerability. It requires us to look critically at ourselves and faithfully examine the depth of our relationship with Christ. And I am on this journey with you. Examining in myself the things that keep me from freely and fully following Christ. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have chosen violence over love. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. Let's pray. O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these our gifts, gifts that have been graciously given to us by you, that we now humbly return to you for the further of your kingdom on earth, so that your abundant, steadfast love may be known to the ends of the earth. Amen. Randy's sister, Sue Jones, just found out that her daughter-in-law is having a little boy in December. Are there any others? Before we pray today, I want to take a moment to say a word we often don't say in church. Abortion. The Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade just a couple of days ago will certainly have a monumental impact on church and society. I can almost guarantee you that there are some people worshiping with us today who have rejoiced over the decision the past couple of days, truly and genuinely believing it to be a movement toward justice and wholeness. And that there are some people worshiping with us today who have wept, truly and genuinely believing it to be a movement away from justice and wholeness. Furthermore, I can almost guarantee you that there are people worshiping with us today for whom the issue of abortion is not political or theoretical at all. 
but extremely personal, an experience they and or their loved ones have been through. Since 1972, the United Methodist Church has held a nuanced position on this issue, one that honors women while also caring for children. The following statements are taken from our social principles. The beginning of life and the ending of life are the God-given boundaries of human existence. Our belief in the sanctity of unborn human life makes us reluctant to approve abortion. But we are equally bound to respect the sacredness of the life and well-being of the mother and the unborn child. We recognize tragic conflicts with life, of life with life that may justify abortion. And in such cases, we support the legal option of abortion under proper medical procedures by certified medical providers. We call all Christians to a searching and prayerful inquiry into the sorts of conditions that may cause them to consider abortion. We entrust God to provide guidance, wisdom, and discernment to those facing an unintended pregnancy. As we pray, I invite us to bring our whole selves whether content or confused, angry or fearful, resolved or uncertain, to the God who knows us intimately and desires wholeness and abundant life for us all. <coughs> this morning, I will open our prayer with a psalm of lament written by the United Methodist Church General Commission on the role of stat, role and status of women. It is adapted from Psalm 13. Let us pray. O oh Lord, how long will you allow women and girls to be unseen and forgotten? How long shall they be left? with the deep sorrow, anguish, and travail. O oh Lord, how long will women and girls be viewed as second-class citizens? How long before women and girls will be able to make decisions for their own health and wellness, as well as for their families? O oh Lord, how long shall they be persecuted by those who have tormented them and taken away their dignity? How long will they continue to be exploited by those who do not share in their burdens, nor carry the weight of their collective pain? O oh Lord, help all to remember that everyone is created in the image of God. Help all humankind to know that we are of equal value in your eyes. Dear Lord, we long for the day when reason, not power, when love, not indifference, will lead us to create a more equitable society. Oh God, we lift up to you the prayers of our hearts. We lift up to you the depths of our emotions. We lift up to you the entirety of our being. Oh God, we long to feel your presence with us. We long to sense the Holy Spirit moving among us. We long to see your love and mercy and justice in the world. Oh God, pour out your spirit upon us. 
that we might faithfully live into the call you have placed on our lives. That we might put aside the things that hinder our full and faithful discipleship. Oh God, you have called each of us. You have created each of us. And you have called us good. Be with us in our joy. Be with us in our struggle. Be with us in our anger and our hurt and our excitement. For we know that all of our emotions, all of what we are, was created by you. And you have called us good. You have called us beloved. You have told us that there is nothing we could ever do to separate ourselves from your unending love. Oh God, we now pray boldly together the prayer Jesus first taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together, Jesus Calls Us, hymn number 398. <laughs>
Jesus has called you. And so go in peace, in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Savior. Amen. Amen.